Thank you very much, dear Gülçin, dear Hans. Thanks so much for this invitation. It's a great pleasure to be with you and with all the distinguished guests which you have again succeeded in bringing to Borum for the 16th conference. Uh, my topic is The Ultimate Foundation of Economic Science. It's uh, the last book uh, authored by Ludwig von Mises, published in 1962. It's a book dealing with methodology and heavy subjects such as the philosophy of science, the philosophy of knowledge, and so on. Therefore, my wife thought it uh, would be a good idea to make it light and peppy. So, therefore, I dressed in a Bermuda way. I also thought, okay, let's start maybe to bring you into the philosophy topic with a few jokes, okay? What's the difference between a philosopher and an engineer? About 100,000 per year. <laughs> and then, of course, we have another one, right? So there are two freshman philosophy students who see the following bulletin posted on the wall of their lecture hall. One, one more? Yep, that's it. Crash course in logical assumptions. Today, Bodrum, 1530. Okay? Neither of them knows what it means, and they're both curious. The pair decide to find the professor and ask some questions. When they locate the professor's uh, lecture hall, the bold of the two enter the building while the other remains outside. So I didn't fully prepare it because ideally it would have been somebody else walking in. Uh, sir, uh, what does crash course in logical assumptions mean? Well, it involves uh, taking information that you have, forming assumptions using logic, and then creating new information. Let me try to answer your question by asking you a question. Do you own a car? Oh, yes, I do. Well, then I can now logically assume that you drive. Oh, yes. I drive on weekends. I go out on dates. Then I can logically assume that you have date partners. Oh, yes, yeah, I have a girlfriend. Then I can logically assume that you are heterosexual. <laughs> oh, well, yes, <laughs> I think I understand what this is all about. Thanks a lot for your time, Professor. So he walks out and sees his friend at the exit, and the other guy asks him, so what's it all about? Well, it's about using information and stuff. Let me answer your question by asking you a question. Do you own a car? Uh, no. <laughs> You're a homosexual. <laughs> <laughs> and one, one further, yeah. So this is not how Mises got into the study of epistemology, and, and, as you might have guessed. Right? So we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the origins of, of Mises' uh, work on, on methodology and then zoom in on his uh, system of, of thought as far as these issues are pertain, the social sciences as compared to the natural sciences. And then finally, I'll say a few words about the ultimate foundation of economic science. So uh, Mises got into the study of uh, epistemology, philosophy, methodology, uh, not out of, I mean, he, he was very widely read, and he was, I mean, you just have a look at his library. It's today located in, at Hillsdale College in the United States. Uh, you see, he was very widely read in philosophers, and he had very ma many distinguished philosophers as friends, for example, uh, Louis Rougier. Um, now, uh, Mises uh, would not probably have never started writing on this unless he had been challenged on these grounds, unless economics, uh, or more, uh, precisely the practical conclusions of economics, had been challenged on these grounds. And the challenge came in the form of an outright rejection of the scientific status of economics. The first time this kind of argument was brought forth was in the middle of the 19th century by Marx. And Mises discusses this in Human Action under the heading of polylogism. Marx had argued, in fact, that um, the uh, economics developed by economic science developed by the classical economics was a bourgeois science. Now, unfortunately, the structure of the bourgeois mind is completely different from the structure of a proletarian mind. Therefore, all this talk was just nonsense, was just gibberish. It has not the slightest relevance for a proletarian society. So we don't have to worry about all of this. And then in Mises' day, there was a warm-up of, of the same conception in the form of the so-called sociology of knowledge. And the sociology of knowledge boiled down, started from the same premise, namely that human minds are structured differently, and therefore 
whatever people think is just a reflection, it's a necessary pro product of their class situation and of their, of their history and so on. It has not the slightest relevance for, for other people. So whatever objections and arguments people like Mises and later than Milton Friedman and Murray Rothbard and so on and Hans Hermann Hoppe might bring up, it just doesn't count. It's just empty talk. And of course, it's, um, it's a necessary consequence of Marx's overall pretensions that um, uh, all causality uh, is exercised by material forces, right? So Marx believed, as various Greek philosophers in, in, in antiquity, uh, he believed in materialism, right? All uh, things that exist in all thoughts, also in all human actions, have ultimately material causes as their, their origin, right? So there's always physical, chemical processes. This prompt us to think, talk, and uh, speak, uh, and argue uh, in the way we think and talk and, uh, and speak. Um, now, if, if this were true, uh, this is a point that Mises brings up in the ultimate foundation of economic science, well then, of course, uh, you ultimately come to reject uh, any notion of truth, right? It makes no more sense to distinguish between truth and falsehood at all, because whatever I say uh, is just the product of my genesis, and whatever you say or whatever you think is just the product of your genesis. And it makes no sense to, to say, well, this is wrong and this is false. It's just what it is. And it has no relation, necessary relation of any sort, to the, the world outside of us. I'll come back later on, uh, on this point. Right? So this was really what prompted him to look into this in more detail. I mean, what is, is the problem here at stake? And what he found was uh, that, um, in fact, the, the uh, epistemology of the social sciences, and of economics in particular, was very strongly underdeveloped as compared to the uh, theory of knowledge uh, uh, pertaining to uh, the natural sciences, physics, chemistry, uh, and so on. In fact, by uh, his day, so in the 1920s, there was such a, a preconception that was prevalent that the only sciences that were really sciences were, in fact, the natural sciences, precisely because they were dealing only with uh, material uh, factors. Now, um, so uh, go, uh, one further, right? So one further. So Mises could uh, rely now in his study on uh, well a half a century almost of uh, epistemological uh, discussions that had taken place after the Middle Ages, in which uh, uh, Thomistic thinking, so real, uh, philosophical realism held sway. Uh, so the modern period was uh, characterized by uh, English nominalism. Now I don't define all of these terms, but I'll be glad to answer, to, to uh, define them in more detail later on, because otherwise it would take too much time. Right? Then we have the French Enlightenment. Um, and the French Enlightenment, uh, uh, was prepossessed with the idea that all scientific knowledge is um, uh, uh, knowledge of the type of the natural laws. And in fact, the, 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 uh, the French revolutionaries were absolutely convinced of materialism. And therefore, they tried, for example, to use the legal co code to social engineer French society according to their tastes. Right? The origin of social engineering is really in the, the French Revolution. A colleague of mine at the University of Angers uh, by the name of uh, Xavier Martin, uh, he is a, a professor of the history of law, he has uh, documented this in painstaking detail. So if any of, uh, of you read French, I, I recommend that you take a look at this. He has done a marvelous job at demonstrating this beyond a shadow of a doubt, that this was in, f in fact the, the uh, conception that infused uh, all of Enlightenment thinking. Now. Uh, after the French Enlightenment, we had August, August Comte, right? and August Comte, well, so he was the first one to uh, articulate really an, an imperialism of uh, the methodology of the natural sciences for all other sciences, right? And so he promised that in the future we would have something of a social science, which he called sociology. He invented the word sociology, just as he invented the word altruism, right? various other so, so altruism rather than charity. Sociology rather than economics, right? So you always get rid of things that you don't like, and you put a completely new discipline and new conception, new attitude in its place. And we'll talk a little bit later about uh, Kant as well. Then after Kant uh, comes uh, uh, logical positivism. Uh, so this was the beginning of the 20th century, and then in, into the 1920s, 
And these were the contemporaries of, of Mises in Vienna. So sometimes the logical positivists are called the, the Vienna Circle. And they held that, I mean, the only um, uh, source of uh, scientific knowledge is uh, empirical uh, analysis in laboratory settings. Uh, and all, the, all other things were just blah, blah. But Mises could also rely on uh, three other uh, most important sources of information, namely the Southwest German school of uh, historiography. Uh, so this was a reaction against Kant, right? against the positivism of Kant. And so these uh, German uh, historians had said, well, wait a minute, I mean, what we are doing in our uh, research and our analysis has nothing to do with uh, the procedure of the of the natural sciences, and in fact, we could not get to our results if we relied on the methods of the natural sciences, just on observation, because we are dealing with meaning. We are dealing with what people, what, prompt, what prompts people to make the decisions that they make, uh, how they see the world, how they see uh, their options, what are uh, the, and, and sometimes, of course, they're wrong, and so on, but this is part of what, what we're dealing with. We're dealing with meaning. And meaning is not something that is observable. It needs to be understood by talking to people, reading what they write, uh, and other things. Right? So the methods are not at all the same. Uh, as in, in, in reading a text, it's not like observing uh, something in a laboratory uh, uh, setting. Right? You need to understand the meaning. The, the, the letters, uh, as such, uh, don't give you the meaning uh, right away. You need to understand the language and the culture. So Mises could rely on this, but he could also rely on um, economic science, which he had studied for a very long time, which he mastered. And as he himself would say, uh, is that, well, uh, the, the best way to, uh, in fact, the, probably the only way of ever saying something meaningful about epistemology and methodology is uh, to master yourself, the science first. Right? And he's, he observes that the great contributions to the um, uh, theory of knowledge in the natural sciences were made by the practitioners. They were made by Galilei uh, and um, uh, Newton and Lavoisier, and the, not made by the theoreticians. So whatever Kant had to say about this and, and Bacon and so on was just derivative, was just really uh, uninformed because they were not practitioners. So you need also be a good economist to be a good uh, philosopher of economics. And lastly, well, there was the tradition, oh, you need to go further, do further down. Further down, yeah, one more, and one more, and one more. Lastly, was the distinguished uh, series of econ uh, economics, economist logicians uh, that had started reflecting and writing about the particular features of uh, economic science. Right? What were the characteristic features of the science as compared to uh, the natural sciences? And here we have, in particular, uh, Wave, uh, Waitley was an uh, Irish bishop, and an economist, uh, John Senior, uh, John Stuart Mill, uh, uh, Carnes, and, and uh, Keynes. So this is John Neville Keynes, right? It's not John Maynard. This is John Neville. is the father of, uh, of uh, John Maynard. He was a decent economist. And then lastly, there was also Karl Menger, uh, who, in his 1883 book on the, uh, with the inquiry into the methods of the social sciences and uh, uh, in economics in particular uh, had made the case for the existence of universal and exact economic laws. Right? So economic laws were truly universal. So they were not just generalizations from historical experience um, and uh, which held as a rule or contingently, but they were universal and exact. So Mises could rely on, on sorts of, of this sort. He himself would then uh, uh, present his uh, reflections on um, uh, methodology in four major publications. The first one was um, Grundlagen der Nationalökonomie, has been translated in 1960 by George Riesman and published by uh, Von Ostrand uh, Company, and has been republished in 2003 with an introduction by a very talented young economist. Um, <laughs> And the, the, the next book was uh, uh, National Economy, human, uh, respectively human action. Uh, then we have Theory and History in 1957, uh, which has recently been translated also in German as a, a very, uh, uh, very, very uh, powerful book. So for those of you who have a philosophical fiber, that's a book to read by Mises. And then last but not least, Ultimate Foundation, the subject of our uh, little presentation today. Now, what we find in Mises is a new uh, uh, synthesis, right? So Mises conceives of uh, science as uh, knowledge, 
um, uh, 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 of causal relationships between things of a certain type, right, classes of things, uh, which is uh, acquired by, by methodol method uh, methodical research, right, and uh, research uh, pertaining both uh, to the natural uh, sciences but also to social sciences. So in German we have this word Geisteswissenschaften, right, and in Mises day this still covered everything that was not purely mechanical. So these were the guys that had something to do with human action. Uh, and then um, uh, uh, these, so, so knowledge of, of uh, uh, these things and, and their causal relationships allows them to explain observed things uh, of that uh, type. Right? Now the sources of information are uh, logic and, and senses and uh, it is these sources of information that characterize scientific knowledge in Mises' conception. So when he uses the word scientific or science, he refers to the fact that, well, the, the knowledge that we have refers to something that we know through logic, that is through reflection on the logical structure of our own mind, the way it works, and uh, through uh, information that comes through sense experience. Right? It doesn't exclude that there be other sources of knowledge. Right? So some people believe that there is a god, uh, it's a triune God and so on, and this might be wrong, right? Uh, excuse me, or it might be also be right, right? Might be right or wrong. Um, and in the case it's, it's right, so it would be knowledge, but in any case it's not scientific knowledge. Right? So it's not science. Now, uh, the important point of this uh, system is the dualism between the natural sciences and the sciences of man. And they result from the fact that as far as uh, nat nature, inanimate nature is concerned, there is a strict regularity. Right? There's a strict uh, uh, sequence of cause and effect and a rigid uh, relationship. Right? So there are constant relationships between cause and effect. Right? So wherever we let drop a certain object, it will fall. Right? So it always, so I won't. <laughs> so it's, right? so it's, there, there's no exception, right? because, precisely because the object doesn't choose. Right? Whereas, uh, as far as human action is concerned, and, and, and in animals we have reaction, right? So the reaction is always according to a predictable pattern, and right? so there's no choice. Wherever there is choice, we need to apply different methods, right? We can no longer start from the premise that there must be a constant relationship between uh, one event and uh, a follow-up. Right? So my reaction uh, to good weather today uh, might be different, is probably b different from my reaction to good weather tomorrow. My reaction to a bad joke, joke today will be different from a, rea a reaction to a bad joke tomorrow, etc. There are no constant relationships. And that's the reason, of course, why, why Mises rejects uh, the, the application of quantitative methods in, in economics and in the social sciences, because it is clear from the outset that, that what you are looking for cannot exist as far as human action is concerned. Now, um, Mises then distinguishes, based on this dualism, between uh, laws of nature, right? so physics, chemistry, geometry, uh, uh, geology, etc., where we have the reign of uh, these um, uh, universal laws. Right? So these um, uh, laws are found through empirical investigations, laboratory experiments, uh, and, uh, and so on. Right? And so what we do in, in, the, in the natural sciences is that we deal with individual facts under the hypothesis that whatever we observe in a singular instance is just an instantiation of a general relationship that will hold true at all times and all places. Right? So if I observe the fall of a, of a, of a bottle today in a, a laboratory experiment setting in Bodrum, I do this with the hypothesis that, well, what I will find will be the same relationship that will hold true in Zurich and in London and in New York and so on at different times. It's just a universal law. Right? So I can approach an individual fact right, with the expectation of finding a universal relationship. Now in economics, um, in economic laws, in economic laws are also universal, but we cannot um, unearth them through uh, examination of an individual case. Rather, it's the other way around. The, the universal laws of economics result from the fact that um, the human, human mind, that what prompts us to act and that what uh, creates um, 
um, uh, activity, uh, human activity, human behavior, uh, is um, directed by a human spirit which is structured in a certain way. So the human spirit pursues objectives right? so, and uh, chooses between different objectives, different possible, possible objectives, chooses different, between different means to attain his objectives. Uh, he values between things that are more important and less important. Uh, he has a notion about what it means to succeed and what it means to fail. Right? All these are uh, categories that we cannot observe, but that we find if we reflect on how we go about when we act. Right? And so as a consequence, these same categories allow us to interpret um, observations that we make, but it's not the observation itself that would provide this kind of information. We get the information about the categories of human action by reflecting on our own uh, mind. Right? And so based on uh, this sort of procedure, right, we get universal and exact laws. Right? So we get them not through observation, but through armchair reasoning. Right? So we sit and reflect calmly. Uh, and uh, this gives us various a priori laws, right? So the quantity theory of money, the laws of return, uh, the increased physical productivity resulting from the division of labor, the increased physical productivity of uh, a capital accumulation, and, and various other things. Um, now, there is a third uh, discipline. Oh, you need to go back. You need to go back. There's a third discipline, which is history, right? Uh, in in uh, historical research, and here Mises picks up from the uh, Southwest German uh, school of histori historiography. In history, we are dealing with contingent causes and consequences of human action. Right? So for example, um, uh, we have a hot day today, right? so my reaction might be to, to drink water. Right? But this uh, re reaction is in no way universal. Right? Uh, tomorrow or in an hour, I might uh, choose to uh, drink have a beer. In, in another instance, I might just choose to avoid the, the heat as far as possible and stay inside. Right? And then there are contingent uh, sequences of choices. Right? I see another person, right? it's a hot day, I see another guy drinking water, I drink water too. Uh, or it's a hot day, I see another guy drinking water, I say, oh, how disgusting, I'll have a better have a beer, etc. Right? So our reaction to uh, uh, the objective context of our action, of our, of our uh, behavior, right, is not predetermined by that context itself. Right? In any case, so now, I mean, what's the explanation for this? Right? We could say, well, there's liberty of action, there's freedom of choice. Right? So we are free to some extent, yes, but Mises would say this is a metaphysical explanation. It's not something that we know through reasoning and that we know through our senses. Right? What we know is that we do make choices. We always have motivations, the motivations are not the same. Where do our motivations come from? Well, actually we don't know. Sometimes we have some, some cling on this, but we have an imperfect uh, explanation of this. Why do we in some situation behave in this way, in another situation we, we behave in a different way. We can and we do. Why? Well, maybe it's because of freedom of choice. Maybe it's just we haven't yet found out how all our choices are determined by physical, chemical reactions in, in the body and so on. He leaves this open. He says we cannot answer this question based on scientific information. We just don't know. Okay? That's Mises' take on this. So in historical explanations, Right? We combine both universal elements, laws of nature and economic laws, and contingent elements. Right? So the historian really brings it together. It's a little bit like the, the lawyer, right? He brings all elements, everything that bears on this case together. Right? And his main interest is in identifying the elements that make the situation unique. Right? So he's dealing with individual facts, like in the, uh, the natural science as well. We're dealing with individual observations. But his approach is very different. He wants to unearth meaning, which the physicists and the chemists cannot. And it's not interested in it. It's not his business. But he wants to find meaning. And so he needs to get to something that he can only get through understanding the motivations of that person. It's neither natural laws nor economic laws that give him these individual elements. Right? So he needs to apply specific understanding. OK. We move on to the ultimate foundation of economic science. Right? So what we find here, just a few preliminaries about the, the, this book, 
right? The book is not meant to present a philosophy or, uh, I said before, it's a, it's a system of methodology, yes. It's, but he doesn't say, well, I'm presenting my philosophy, or I'm presenting, say. He says on the opening page, he wishes to expose certain ideas that any attempts to deal with the theory of knowledge ought to take into full account. Right. So he wants to highlight certain facts about economics as a science, about the social sciences more generally, and um, uh, considerations of a logical sort against logical positivism and other doctrines that contest the scientific character of economics. So whoever builds a philosophy of, uh, of knowledge of all sciences has to take them into account. Uh, and that presupposes that we need to know other sciences, right? We need to know other sciences fairly well. Let me quote here Mises. This is very, he says, uh, uh, there's no contract with a state and there's no legal guarantee of what belongs to us and what is our own untouchable property. No, this is, this is not Mises. It's a professor. You get sometimes confused. Uh, uh, ah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. The study of economics, says Mises, has again and again been led astray by the vain idea that economics must proceed according to the pattern of other sciences. The mischief done by such misconstructions cannot be avoided by admonishing the economists to stop casting longing glances upon other fields of knowledge or even to ignore them entirely. Ignorance, whatever subject it may concern, is in no case a quality that could be useful in the search of truth. What is needed to prevent a scholar from garbling economic studies by resorting to the methods of mathematics, physics, biology, history, or jurisprudence it's not slighting and neglecting these sciences, but on the contrary, trying to comprehend and to master them. He who wants to achieve anything in praxeology must be conversant with mathematics, physics, biology, history, jurisprudence, lest he confuse the tasks and the methods of the theory of human action with the tasks and methods of any of these other branches of knowledge. Okay, that's quite a program. Now, Mises then got the objection from a student. Um, when I once expressed this opinion in a lecture, a young man in the audience objected, you are asking too much of an economist, he observed. Nobody can force me to employ my time in studying all these sciences. And his answer was, nobody asks or forces you to become an economist. <laughs> right? So you need to understand the other sciences. You need, of course, to understand your own. Right? And he says, well, the, the actual uh, contributions to economic epistemology uh, have been made by good economists. We move on to the next slide. Yeah, next. Okay, a few highlights from the book because I have four and a half minutes to go. First one is that Mises makes the uh, case that uh, any uh, knowledge has a practical dimension. Right? Therefore, the praxeological a priori what we know about human action is part of all scientific endeavors. And this, of course, is also what Hans Hermann Hoppe uh, had found out in his own doctoral dissertation, and in the course of which he, he came across Mises. Right? So he had the same idea and had a distinguished predecessor, um, which doesn't diminish in any way Hans's contribution. He made uh, lots of contributions to the same topic. So praxeology provides the ultimate foundation of science the ultimate foundation of economic science, starting with economics, because so far the epistemologists have not taken account of the particular features of economics. Right? And not only is this a branch of knowledge that is somehow also important, needs to be taken account of in order to complete the picture, it is in a way the most fundamental science because all knowledge itself is activistic. Uh, and therefore the categories of human action also apply to scientific, to any intellectual activity. Second point is this refutation of, of positivism, right? Positivism being the idea that uh, the, the only source of scientific knowledge is, inf is empirical uh, information, right? And uh, that all theoretical constructs are uh, either without the slightest scientific value or are just tautologies, right? So it's just definitional games. And then Mises crushes this 
with a slight observation that, well, if you apply this doctrine to itself, then it, it turns out it is not a scientific doctrine, right? Because the, the idea that there are only two sorts of uh, propositions, either you have uh, these analytical, empirical uh, uh, statements in which you find out something about the real world, or, and the rest is just blah, blah, right? Uh, well, well, then clearly this doctrine itself is not found out empirically. It's not based on observation, so it must be blah, blah. Um, so positivism is self-contradictory, and in its extreme form of materialism, as I've said in my introductory comments, it leads to the outright rejection of any notion of truth and falsehood, right? And therefore, it must lead to utmost skepticism, right? If we, everything that we think and that we say, that we hear other people say, is just an, just an outgrowth of their individual genesis, it has no meaning to say, well, this is true or false, it's just what they blah, blah. Right? Cannot be true or false. But in that case, of course, either you become completely skeptical and apathetic, but it's just, okay, you know, part of the cosmic becoming and, and going and so on, has no significance, or, if I'm of the more activist type, then I need to make sure that the right opinions, which are my own, somehow get a better here. So therefore you start to eliminate people who think not like yourself. Now this brings us to lots of connection points in the, in the present day. Now, uh, critique of statistical research, I'll, I'll jump this, but I should like to highlight the, the next point. Right, the critique of quantum physics, which you find on pages 22 to 24 of, of that book, is of my edition here, which is not the same that I've given before, it's the 1996 edition. So Mises says here that in quantum physics, we, um, we are unable to determine the uh, location and uh, movement of uh, individual electrons uh, according to the principles of Newton, Newtonian dynamics. We cannot determine it exactly. Right? We can determine it only stochastically. And Mises says, well, okay, that's the present state of our knowledge. It does not follow therefrom that there is no determination of these uh, natural events, right? Because there seems to be a contradiction between this finding, right? it's only stochastically determined, and on the other hand, the position that in inanimate uh, things, right, all uh, changes follow a regular pattern without any exception. So it says, okay, presently we don't know why they behave exactly in each single case like this, but this is just deficient knowledge. It's because we are reasoning under the hypothesis that we have already found the ultimate uh, determinants. We were reasoning in terms of where we have electrons and uh, protons and neutrons, but maybe there are subdivisions, and probably there are subdivisions, and once we take them in, into account, right, there are subclasses of, of objects, we will find the exact determination. Wonderful uh, argument uh, of an a prime or a nature. Okay, and then finally, science, metaphysics, and uh, religion. I've uh, said already before that Mises distinguishes uh, science from metaphysics and religion, which does not mean that he disparages metaphysics and uh, science, right? So he writes, for example, here, to live in a universe with whose final and real structure one is not familiar, or not perfectly familiar, creates in itself a feeling of anxiety. To remove this anguish and to give men certainty about the last things has been from the earliest day the solicitude of religion and metaphysics. Right? So they fulfill a, a role that science cannot fulfill. And science cannot go there by its very nature, but it doesn't mean that this is undignified or um, uh, not important. The human mind in its search for knowledge resorts to philosophy or theology precisely because it aims at an explanation of problems that the natural sciences cannot answer. Philosophy deals with things beyond the limits that the logical structure of the human mind enables man to infer from the exploits of the natural sciences. So in conclusion, I had one other thing, so I wanted to criticize Mises, but my time is running out. Okay, so I'll bring up this point if you are interested in this in the question and answer period. In conclusion, let me just become light and peppy again uh, and uh, consider the situation of a mountain climber who suddenly slips and is just able to uh, hold on to a tiny edge on a very high cliff, right? As his strength weakens, he looks desperately at the sky and asks, is there anybody up there? And a booming voice comes, yes. 
What should I do? Say a prayer and let go. And then climber, the climber, after a moment's thought, says, is there anybody else? <laughs> Thank you for your attention.